so much for inviting me here. This has been awesome to do uh, kind of like an in-person conference, and it's been a spectacular conference. You guys have done a great job. So thank you. So I'm just going to give a little talk about um, kind of when to use a three comma, when you ha basically have to use a three comma osteotomy versus when you can get away with multiple posterior column osteotomies. And the fact of the matter is most of the time, if you have flexibility in the spine, you don't need to cut a three column osteotomy, but there's certain situations where that certainly becomes the case. And so we'll kind of go over that, some things I've picked up so far in my short practice and mostly stuff that I've picked up from my mentors as well. So I don't have any disclosures. Um, so I think first off, just to make sure we're all talking about the same thing, right? So, um, by posterior column osteotomies, I mean Ponte osteotomies, I mean Smith-Peterson osteotomies, I mean type two osteotomies. Okay, we're not talking about type one inferior facetectomies by the Schwab classification. Basically, you have to have a mobile disc to be working through, right? Three column osteotomies, we're gonna bundle into the entire group, right? Of um, pedicle subtraction osteotomies, extended pedicle subtraction osteotomies, VCRs and extended VCRs, right? And, and these are the kind of, um, the, the kind of osteotomies where you completely disarticulate the spine. You can kind of almost put it anywhere you want to, right? Um, certainly higher risk, and if you can avoid it with other measures, it's, it's probably best for the patient, but um, sometimes you have to. So in terms of posterior column osteotomies, these are generally a posterior shortening procedure. Um, uh, generally, you can produce about 10 degrees of sagittal plane correction. Um, it, re it involves complete removal of the facet the ligamentum flavum and the in inferior lamina, so as not to, when you close it down, um, cause iatrogenic stenosis. Um, originally described as the Smith-Peterson osteotomy, which is generally a misnomer if you're saying you're doing Smith-Peterson osteotomies because that's uh, described through rheumatoid arthritis or ankylosing spondylitis, and it's, in, it's a lengthening procedure actually, right? Uh, where you uh, disrupt the ALL. Uh, Ponte kind of is the one who kind of, um, uh, modernized, uh, working through a disc space as a shortening procedure. Um, but I think posterior column osteotomy is kind of the catch-all term that, that kind of helps talking about it. They're effective, they increase range of motion, uh, you know, they can uh, achieve similar correction over multiple levels to three column osteotomies. Um, compared to just performing inferior facetectomies, they, they, uh, you get improved uh, correction in scoliosis, uh, especially at the periapical segments. Uh, and they're relatively safe uh, in large AIS databases, you know, less than 0.5% uh, neurologic complications in the uh, posterior column osteotomy groups. Um, uh, slightly increased blood loss if compared to just doing inferior facetectomies. Um, and with well-planned in a flexible uh, deformity with multiple different disk spaces to be working through, um, you can certainly get significant corrections um, just by the additive effect over multiple different levels, especially in a flexible spine and a flexible deformity. Um, so uh, a three column osteotomy is oftentimes needed in these types of cases. And so um, this is a complete destabilizing procedure of all three columns. You need temporary fixation uh, because you're gonna, the benefit is though, is that you're gonna be able to correct through extremely rigid or completely fused deformities, right? Uh, in general, a PSO will get you about 30 degrees of correction in most cases, and with a VCR, you can even get more, uh, depending on the situation. Um, and, and so these, the kind of the different types, which we sort of already went over. Um, but there's a downside, you're right? You get more correction, you get to put the correction anywhere you want it to be, right? Based on the patient's factors, right? But blood loss in major series for pedicle subtraction osteotomies and VCRs is extremely high. Neurologic injury rates are significantly higher than posterior column osteotomy groups. Now, some of that's because of the population that actually needs this procedure, but also the procedure itself is not without risk. Uh, and the pseudoarthrosis rates are, are significantly higher. Um, but there are certain situations, even a less severe deformity, where if everything is rigid and fused through, you don't have disc spaces to be working through, a pedicle subtraction osteotomy is sometimes the only way to get the correction within the lumbar spine. Um, so uh, these are kind of some of the factors that I kind of look at as I'm kind of going through a patient and sort of deciding you know, what type of osteotomy is this particular patient gonna need. And so I think flex, uh, in terms of the anatomy of the patient, their flexibility and their bone quality, 
uh, alignment considerations in terms of how angular their deformity is and, and where it is and how important for that particular patient, I believe, restoring their spinal shape may be. And then patient-specific issues like their age and comorbidities. And I think you have to take all these things into account. Um, and certainly there's no like hard and fast rules here, right? Uh, every patient's an individual uh, in terms of what you need, want and what their goals are, right? So um, for flexibility, I think your supine x-rays or scalp views from your CT uh, are gonna give you a ton of information, right? So if the deformity largely corrects when they lie down, then there's, and you have multiple disc spaces that you can be working through, there's almost no situation in a flexible spine where you're gonna end up needing to do a three column osteotomy. Obviously never say never, never say always, but um, the rigid ones are kind of a, the ones that are a little bit more difficult to make that decision. But in general, once you loosen things up posteriorly, if the disc space is infused, with the viscoelactive properties and kind of letting the spine sag, you can get a lot of the correction that you need, even in a very rigid spine. But if a patient is fused over enough levels, right, where you can't work around the fused segments to get your correction, typically that, those are kind of the cases where uh, if you're gonna get your correction, you need a three-column osteotomy. So flexibility. So this patient had over 10 previous surgeries, um, multiple infections, all of her hardware was taken out, she was falling over, she was actually solidly fused from uh, L about L2 to the pelvis uh, from her previous surgeries, but uh, flat back, major deformity. I was kind of thinking, oh my goodness, when she came into the office, uh, do I need to do a VCR and a PSO? This is gonna be one hell, heck of a case, right? But then you look at her CT scan and her, her scoliosis goes from 61 degrees to 38 degrees. This is very flexible. Her kyphosis goes from 73 to 32. So you know, just lying down, you've gotten a ton of correction already. You can help that out a little bit more with some osteotomies. And she was a relatively older, kind of sick patient. And we were able to just get her corrected just with PCOs uh, through her TL junction. Not a perfect correction, but you know, one surgery, uh, relatively minimal blood loss out of the hospital pretty quickly. And she was happy with her outcome so far, or has been. She's about a year and a half out. Um, the second thing to consider is the bone quality of the patient, right? So if you're gonna be trying to um, correct through disc spaces and if the spine is relatively rigid, you need good anchor points to get that correction, right? Um, and so uh, the preoperative uh, DEXA, the hip and wrist, um, right? The spine can be, um, uh, can sometimes give you some falsely elevated levels, right? Because of osteophytes. Uh, elliptical ROI, uh, I'm using a lot on patients where I have CT scans, certainly, shown you know, that uh, it, it, when these numbers get lower, your, your rate for um, implant failure uh, issues uh, uh, are, cert are higher. Uh, the issue is we don't really know exactly where the cutoffs are yet. This is kind of relatively newer. I think the most recent review on this topic said, you know, once you're less than 135 on your elliptical ROI, you probably want to start worrying. And, and the key to this is really you know, stronger bone equals better fixation, which means you can transmit more force to the spine. And, um, and try to get your corrections with cantilever effects and compression uh, more effectively. And so um, what can we do about it? If you, you know, just because uh, also we can make now patient's bone stronger uh, with anabolic agents, parathyroid agents. So uh, teriparatide has been shown to increase in insertional torque for pedicle screws when given one month beforehand, um, reduce pedicle screw loosening, for one to two level fusions in osteoporotic women, and then also have higher rates of fusion compared to bisphosphonate. So um, I'd say almost half of my patients now are getting um, uh, at least two months of uh, Forteo prior to surgery if, um, if they're osteoporotic at all. And so that why this becomes, in, this is kind of a nice illustrative case of, of why this is so important, right? So this was a patient who came in my office, uh, had a thoracic disc herniation, he was severely myelopathic, um, and had uh, kind of this uh, proximal uh, junction deformity and also a flat back. Uh, but he had a pretty significant cardiac history. It actually, it had a stent uh, about six months prior um, and, um, and needed an urgent surgery. He was osteoporotic, but really couldn't wait, you know, a couple months for Forteo. So uh, I took him urgently and tried to temporize him, just dealing with the disc herniation and just cutting some posterior column osteotomies uh, and then plugging into his previous fusion mass. And after surgery, I was amazed by, by the correction. And a lot of times I've seen this, especially at the thoracal lumbar junction, um, when you have this fused, all these fused segments, you can really kind of cantilever them back. But the issue was his bone quality wasn't that good. And uh, he was really happy for about three or four weeks. 
and came back to my office at two months, still relatively happy, but couldn't stand up straight. Um, he could walk now, but uh, couldn't stand up straight. And then at that point, I ended up having to take him back uh, to first realign him, and now he needed a pedicle subtraction osteotomy, and then also kind of plug everything into the pelvis and get him a really strong base this time. He also now had had his two months of Forteo and did well the second time, but probably could have avoided a, a second surgery if I had more time or maybe gone to the pelvis in the original surgery. Um, alignment consideration. So deformity angular ratio is not described for, um, for deciding between osteotomy types, but it's an objective measure kind of to look at um, uh, kind of how angular a particular patient's deformity is. So um, Dr. Lenke in his kind of large series has shown that uh, a total deformity angular ratio greater than 25 or a sagittal deformity angular ratio greater than 15 is associated with higher risk for spinal cord uh, events during surgery, right? And so that's kind of how it was described, but I also kind of use it as a little bit of an objective measure kind of, because sh generally short angular curves, if you're gonna correct them, uh, especially if they're fused, you're more likely to need a three column osteotomy versus more long sweeping curves. Uh, you're more likely to get away with multiple posterior column osteotomies. So uh, a case like this, two kind of 80 degree curves, right? Um, but very different, one's in the sagittal plane, one's completely fused. The other one's in the coronal plane with multiple open disc spaces um, over much more levels, right? So in this case, the deformity angular ratio was 27. I did, and she required a VCR for correction. And then in this case, uh, it was 16, multiple posterior column osteotomy is able to get very nice correction. Um, then finally, uh, location of the deformity and the importance of spinal shape. So this um, is a little bit more of a, kind of a maybe more controversial topic, but um, it's certainly not controversial to say that if you can give a patient what should be their normal anatomy, it's probably better than anything else, right? And so if the risk of getting a patient back to their normal anatomy is relatively low, you should certainly try to do that. So to create the lordosis in the lower lumbar spine if you can. Um, so Bruce Lee with his, the classification now with kind of five different subtypes based on pelvic incidence and apex of lordosis within the lumbar spine. And um, they've shown in some of their series now like uh, that if you kind of restore a patient to what their classification should be, the mechanical complication rates uh, are lower, PJK rates are lower in their series. Um, but uh, the limitations kind of this as of right now is, you know, when more work needs to be done, does spinal shape really correlate with functional outcomes? Uh, and then in cases where you're not gonna be able to get the correction, uh, without cutting a three column osteotomy, is it worth it in that particular patient to restore their spinal shape if you can get them balanced with a less risky surgery, right? Um, and so, uh, and then the other question is when, if you're gonna be going all the way up to the upper thoracic spine in certain cases, do the, do the rules really hold in those situations as well? Um, and so, you know, a case like this, this patient was a Rusely type two, she was completely fused through her mid lumbar spine, um, actually kyphotic, um, but with PCOs above and below her kyphotic deformity is able to get her balanced and corrected. And actually her, even her pelvic tilt, which a lot of people will say, you need to cut that low pedicle subtraction osteotomy to correct the pelvic tilt. Even her pelvic tilt corrected and she's happy other than having a little bit of a prominent abdomen um, with her overall um, picture in this case, despite not having appropriate spinal shape. And then finally, taking into consideration how aggressive you need or should be with the partic this particular patient, right? One issue is how much correction do you need to get, right? So not every 70-year-old uh, needs to have an SVA of zero when you leave, uh, when they leave the hospital. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, spinal paramic uh, alignments uh, change uh, as we age um, and our thresholds are more and more anterior with time. Part of that's probably physiologic. Also kind of what you can talk, what correlates with severe disability shifts kind of um, towards more kyphogenic uh, uh, postures um, with uh, later uh, age. And finally, medical comorbidities. I was a UCSF talk, so I feel like obliged to talk about frailty. Um, uh, the ASD uh, uh, frailty index. Um, and so, but there's a lot of different ways to kind of see kind of how medically ill a patient is prior to surgery. Uh, and um, uh, kind of 
uh, uh, you know, certainly more frail patients more likely to have postoperative complications and maybe either they shouldn't have surgery or uh, a less invasive surgery may be a better option for them. So that's kind of a couple of things that I go through in general. Um, obviously, everyone has a lot of other kind of things they take into account and not all of these rules are, are, some of these rules are meant to be broken sometimes as well for a particular patient and their particular needs. But um, thank you. <laughs>